am one of the three people who thought this would be a good idea. <laughs> Uh, but did not know how to do it. But luckily, the town of Beaufort knows exactly how to put on a fantastic festival, and I think they've done exactly that for us this weekend. <laughs> we have a number of sponsors and partners uh, and in-kind sponsors who made all of this possible, and rather than taking up the time to list them, I'm just going to encourage you to look at the poster that lists all those nice folks in the lobby it is shorter than most Pat Conroy novels and many Pat Conroy sentences, so you can actually <laughs> read it very quickly. Um, putting this festival together has, has kind of been an experience not unlike writing a novel. Very often a writer knows where a novel will begin or he knows where it will end or she knows where it will end. But everything that happens along the way in the middle is a pleasant discovery and that's true for the reader as well. Uh, that's certainly been the case with this festival. We, we knew that people would show up, and we knew that you would have a fantastic time, but the, the remarkable things that have been said on this stage and in this audience have been surprising to all of us, uh, and it's been a wonderful shared experience for everyone involved. And I want you to applaud for yourselves for making that happen, because that's really on you. Another thing we discovered along the way is just how many of you wanted to see the exhibit at the Verdeer House today and could not do that. So, uh, thanks to our very wonderful friends at the Pat Conroy Archives and at Historic Buford Foundation, there will be a second gallery talk and tour tomorrow at 12.30, and that exhibit will remain open until 4 o'clock. So if you did not see it today, I encourage you to go see it tomorrow. It is phenomenal, uh, and we want you to have that opportunity. So many of you are here from beyond South Carolina that I get to do the thing that is almost never necessary in South Carolina, and that is introduce Walter Edgar, uh, because everybody in South Carolina knows this man. He is uh, South Carolina history defined. He is the author of South Carolina, a history the book, six pounds of knowledge about the state of South Carolina <laughs> that has gone through 11 printings. He is the host of South Carolina's Journal on SCETV Radio, and that was actually the genesis for this particular panel. Uh, Walter interviewed Pat and Mike and Jim and Tim and Kathy for an episode of the Journal, and it was phenomenal. If you've not ever listened to that piece, you can still find the podcast for it. Uh, but uh, the, the audience for that was three people, Walter, the producer, and me, and it was better than just good radio, it was good theater. It needed to be in front of an audience, and we did that with an encore performance at the South Carolina Book Festival a number of years ago. And those two interviews are now at the heart of a book that's called Conversations with the Conroys that these folks will be signing along with other books right after this panel. Tonight they're going to continue that conversation, and as you can see we've added some new voices into the mix as well, uh, joining them on stage will be Pat's favorite wife, as he says, sometimes his eighth <laughs> wife, as he also introduces you, the phenomenal novelist Cassandra King. <laughs> and we're very fortunate to have on stage with us one of Pat's daughters, Melissa, who is continuing the family business as a children's author and artist. Melissa Conroy. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Walter Edgar. Thank you, Jonathan. And I asked Pat how I should introduce everybody tonight. Jonathan's already introduced at least two of the ladies. But he said to introduce Jim as his favorite sibling, and Tim as his favorite sibling, and Mike as his favorite sibling, and Kathy as his favorite sibling, and himself as his favorite alter ego. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's pick up where we left off about 14 months ago. Uh, we had you in the studio, and Sandra, you and Melissa were not there, but you listened to it. Um, and we had the five of you all together talking about growing up with the great Santini. And let's maybe start with that and what that book meant to you. I think Kathy you may have expressed it better than your brothers. That 
sitting, sitting in that room. And folks, well, when we do the show, like to have people in the studio because we have this ISDN line which NPR uses, you know, and it's somewhere. But if you're sitting across from somebody, a smile, a grimace, a wink, and in this case, there were some tears, makes all the difference in the world as to how to carry the conversation. But I think, Kathy, I really would like to start with you, not just because you're the only girl there, but I really, your comments from the heart, I think really got the conversation started. So you want me to talk about? Talk, talk about <laughs> growing up with the great, San your reaction to the book, when the great Santini was published, you had a reaction like, this is me, this is my life. Right. Well, what's so difficult is we had a lifetime of secrets. And when the book came out, there were no more secrets. And I had to be able to not only deal with all of you, but with myself. Mm. And that was very difficult. All right. Mike, you want to pick that up? I knew I should have read that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. A sick Conroy sense of humor. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the part of being in the military family, you move every year. The University of South Carolina was the 13th school I'd attended. Now, Dad was a beast, as Pat portrayed him. In, in the book and, and got portrayed by Robert Duvall in the movie. The, he was difficult to live with. I, after graduating from the fourth high school I attended, I left home the day after high school graduation. And my gift was from my parents was a suitcase. So, <laughs> so, and you know how some families, especially the modern families now, the, the children come back, they, they leave, go to work, and they come back because it's cheaper. None of us ever considered that. <laughs> and so I'm not sure they didn't have a good way of getting kids away from the nest. But I'll let um, Tim, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I remember the, the book was, reading that book was very hard. Um, and Big words. <laughs> Big words. <laughs> and, and it was, and, 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 and maybe a lot of the authors have talked about favorite lines, and, and maybe the favorite line in that book for me was the end. <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading the book, and um, I think we all got it the same night, and Kathy and I and Mike read it that night and finished it that night, at various times in the night. Um, <clears throat> Tim, of course, took a couple days to read it. <laughs> but I, uh, I remember reading it, and one of us would finish, and the other one would finish, and I noticed that we were all crying at the end because my father died in the book. You know, but we were, <laughs> we were real happy with that. <laughs> Because uh, we didn't know how it was going to end, but you know, I, I would also like to add that in nine years I'll turn seventy, and I'd kind of like to see the same thing uh, for, for my birthday. It would be a great thing for me. I really appreciate it. Okay, Melissa, growing up with the son of the great Santini, did you ever feel like you were growing up with Santini Jr.? Megan and Jessica, my sisters, up on stage to help me out with that one. Um, <clears throat> that's a good that, that probably was not fair, but seriously, you read the book. When did you read the book and react? How did you react as a as a child? To that, that was your granddad. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because I knew a different granddad than. Um, can, oh, you, can you can't hear me? Can you off here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. Can we turn the mics up a little bit so the audience is having some hard is time Is this here. better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the great Santini uh, was, he was imposing. He, uh, he was 
extremely masculine. And, um, you know, I remember him as being about eight feet tall, uh, which I don't think is really true in the end. But he, uh, you know, to us, he was also a lot of fun, which may be a little hard to believe. But we, th those things that um, might have been scary, um, like residually scary for having grown up with him, to us was amusing because he, um, he didn't treat us the same way. You, I think you can give Dad some credit for that. I think when we were, this is the way Dad would, um, would treat him. I mean, Dad figured out that he was a lot more clever than, um, than Don. Everybody so, <laughs> yes. Uh, so he basically made fun of him all the time. And he, you know, like Don would come in and he'll say, um, they'll say, hey kids, I hear the Rolling Stones are playing this weekend. And you know, dad will say, hey, Mr. Rock and Roll, huh? Um, <clears throat> and at one point, I think, when we were little, uh, Don said, all right, line up for inspection, kids. And uh, to us, that was a game. Um, but dad saw that, and he's like, whoa, dad. And he, he made him stop. So um, I think pretty, I think just the, the relationship had already shifted between Don and Dad when I was, when I was young. And, and I will also say that Don was the guy who lived, um, the great Santini that was, was the guy who lived um, in Atlanta. He was my granddad who was around. He took, us to, um, he took us to our doctor's appointments. He came to all of our soccer games. Um, he did get kicked out of a couple of them. <laughs> but he still came. And I, I appreciated the passion that he put forth in our support. Um, and uh, so, he, so it was, it, was, uh, it was different for us. You know, there was still that, um, that energy and, and that intensity, but it, uh, it was a different relationship, so. Okay, all right, Sandra. And <laughs> folks, in, in disclosure, I knew Sandra King, we come from the same part of Alabama. I knew when she was one of those same sweet girls before she married Pat. Um, I'm still the same sweet <laughs> You are still the same sweet girl, I know. Uh, <laughs> And you've written two books to prove it. Uh, That's right. When you read the Great San, had you read the Great Santini before you and Pat started dating? Oh yeah, I'd, I'd read all Pat's books, and uh, so Mr. Romantic, one of our first—I uh, hate to say dates because we were about fifty, you know, then. But uh, <laughs> when uh, when we met, but Pat wanted to take me to family reunion. And I was one of the reasons that he wanted to take me, and it was on his mom's side, one of the Conroes, um, was that I would get to meet his dad for the first time. I was absolutely terrified. And he could not have been more charming to me. And it was almost, and I still wonder if maybe a lot of this was what he was up to, it was almost as if he still was trying to prove Pat wrong about him. Like, whatever you've heard about me, you know, is not true. I'm mean, this very gallant, charming, you know, gentleman. And I knew him for about a, a year and a half before he died. And he was, he stayed, you know, just as nice to me as, as he possibly could be. But I never doubted, I, I'm not saying that to say, you know, well, why did Pat write this book? That's not his dad. Uh, I didn't doubt. He had that very steely look in his eye. Mm -hmm. We had one time that he, he was at dinner at our house and he snapped about something and I just froze and I saw Pat freeze too. And so I, I knew it was, you know, it was under there. It was still under there somewhere, but he had done a very good job, you know, okay. smoothing let's, that part of himself. Let's, let's do what you and Melissa said about, uh, and Pat, you and I talked about this earlier when we did the one read in Columbia about the changing relationship you had with your dad later in life. And um, I think all of you saw a little bit of a dip, saw some difference. And let's, let's comment on that from the, from the great Santini to the Don that Melissa described. Boys. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, why don't you start off? <laughs> it's on your arm. I don't know why, this, don't know why this story popped in my head, but and this is sort of an odd story about you know, how he never taught 
me or, or I didn't see him use tools. And so he never taught anything about a hammer or a screwdriver. He didn't show us how to do anything like dads do. And then years later, he, was, he had that job in Atlanta after he retired as a, a Pinkerton guard. Remember that? And he had a tool. He had a hammer in his car. <laughs> and I said, Dad, what are you doing with that hammer? He goes, Tim, I use that if I need to kill somebody. They won't, <laughs> they won't press charges. And so anyway, a different father. He was a different father. Okay. Wait a minute, Tim, let's just jazz about it. He didn't let us, <clears throat> let us teach us how to use tools. <laughs> he taught us how to use fists. <laughs> And, you know, what, what is hard, I see this always with my brothers and sisters, it's hard to talk about dad because of the change. Yeah, yeah. Because, and here was, my hatred was so bad of dad. Um, you know, when I left home, I didn't want to see him again. I didn't want to talk to him again. I thought if he died, I wouldn't go to his funeral. I thought, of course, you know, the problem was mom. You know, we, you know, you're drawn back in because of mom. And then mom dies at 59, and then Santini, after he reads this book that I write, that you know, everybody in his family hated, suddenly we are dealing with this guy, um, you know, Mr. Rogers, uh, you know, with <laughs> Mr. Rogers of Simper Fi. Is, is, is now, <clears throat> and it drives me crazy to hear Wu and my children talk about him as a grandfather. Because he would say that and Wu loved him and Jessica and Megan, they all loved him and, you know, Susanna loved him. And, you know, I'd see dad, you know, okay girls, go to the, go to the head before you leave, no waterworks, no waterworks. And you know this kind of joyful, spirited guy that I never saw in my life when we were growing up. And I don't know if you ever saw glimpses. I saw not one glimpse of him being a nice man when we were growing up. I don't know if that was different for you all. Okay. Mike? No, that, that was tough. You know, there's no doubt about that. And I didn't like that, you know, but I don't think that's very unusual at that period of time when people were growing up, you know, fathers were tough. The, uh, you know, and we grew up on military bases. So where we moved every year, we actually thought everybody moved every year. You know, that's just what people in that profession did. The Marine Corps sent them around. The, uh, Tim said dad didn't teach us how to use tools. It was an easy, uh, reason for that, dad had no idea how to use a tool. <laughs> he couldn't use a screwdriver. If he wanted a light bulb changed, he'd get Pat, me, one of the kids to go change that light bulb. You mentioned he's a, he was afraid of electricity. But, uh, so if there was a, a spark out of some cord, you know, a five-year-old was supposed to go down there and figure it out. <laughs> and, uh, he wasn't going to do it. <laughs> That's just the way it is. But um, dad made a complete change. You know, once he got divorced, he realized that we were back at mom, that, um, you know, we didn't, as adults, we didn't have to see him. We didn't have to put up with his stuff. The, um, so in order to see us as adults, he had to change. And to his credit, he did a great job of changing. I'll pass this to Jim. He, um, one of the things I think changed with my father is that we talked to him a little differently. When we were younger, if we said anything he didn't like, he'd hit us. But I remember one time, this is an example of my father when I realized he wasn't the brightest bulb in the world. He, um, we had gone to see the great Santini, and it was playing in Atlanta. It was on for so many weeks and you know I'd go visit my father which wasn't often but I'd visit him in Atlanta and he'd drive me from theater to theater saying it's been on 16 weeks at this theater Jim <laughs> great Santini so, you know, 
And he also made a statement. This is God's honest truth. He said, Jim, do you know why people are going to love this movie? And I said, why, Dad? And he said, because people in America have never witnessed a military funeral before. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, do you think people are going to this movie because it's a military funeral? And he said, yes, it's, it's really unique and it's something people in the United States haven't seen. <laughs> And now as a child, I would never have said this, but as an adult, I looked at him and I said, I have the dumbest father in America. <laughs> and he, uh, I, you know, he wasn't real pleased to hear that, but I just said, what a dope. You know, yeah, people are in line to see the military funeral. <laughs> and, uh, so that's kind of how it changed with my father. We were able to talk to him in a different way as adults. And as Pat once said, which I thought was a great line, my father had the greatest second act of his life. He had a terrible first act, but he, he went through many years to try to change. He was still difficult to be around. He had an ego the size of this room, but he did make a great effort, and he was a much nicer person as an adult. So I would not have trusted my kids to be anywhere near him, though. <laughs> All right. Kathy? I do want to say I've heard a lot of people in the last couple of days say some wonderful things about my brother, Pat. And what I want to say is, this book changed our life. He gave us a dad that we probably would have never had before. <laughs> Pat, you want to add anything on that, on that particular? What did Kathy say? <laughs> <laughs> She was cheering for it, but I did not hear it. She said that you gave, with that book, you gave all of your siblings a dad they'd never had before. <laughs> and you're thanking me for that? <laughs> <laughs> on, on this side of the room, it was a warm clap. It was, it was, it was kind of fun. It is <clears throat> where I feel bad, even now, even sitting with my brothers and sisters now. <clears throat> you know, sitting with, you know, Sandra and Wu is my image of dad is still a dark one. You know, this was, you know, I told dad one time, you know, and he, dad would drive me crazy with this. You know, everybody thinks you're a liar who's read your book, <laughs> you know. They meet me, Mr. Nice Guy, and they wonder, why this guy, this kid exaggerates. And I said, Dad, you know, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry the book upset you. I'm sorry it upset your family. And his family in Chicago, you know, just went crazy. But I said, let me tell you one thing about this. Even though you've not admitted you ever laid a hand on your children or my mother, and I don't think Dad ever did. I don't, he may have to you, he didn't to me. Is I want to tell you one thing. Whatever you do now does not make up for my ruined childhood. I was scared from the time I was a boy, and I was scared dead, I think I was scared dead till he died, you know, to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, he was powerful, he abused that power, he beat up mom, he beat up us. I, I would have to, as the oldest son, I'd have to watch until, and I don't think he hit the girls, did he, Kathy? He didn't hit me. Well, there's that a reason okay. here, Carol. That's Carol. I, <laughs> <laughs> you can't blame Dad for no, that. I mean, he, gets, he gets a pass from all of us. <laughs> he didn't hit her enough. <laughs> Just joking. But, uh, but I, I, you know, you said, Dad, you cannot make up for that ruined childhood. You know, no matter what you do. And that thing, I still find I have not... You've gotten rid of that completely. With that scene last night in the Great Santini, oh. when the family was waiting for uh, Great Santini to return. There, there, I remember so many times wishing he would never return. Just, and that movie caught that. In the, in the happiest times in the, in the family, the most normal times we had as family was when he was gone to war. Thank God for Vietnam. I love the war. <laughs> I, I, I love the war. I prayed for war. 
I didn't care if we fought Vatican City. <laughs> I mean, if, it, if it would take him dad out, I was, I was all for it. And that's the scene last night that bothered me, that movie, I've not seen the movie in 30 years, was the scene of the kid saying, I prayed for him to die my whole life. And I thought, God, I did that. And every time dad went up in a plane, I just simply pray, burn it, uh, lightning hit it, anything else, but don't let him come back. And you know, I, th I find that a tough childhood to live, to live with and, and to write about. I you know, found it very tough. Well, you mentioned the reaction of the Chicago Conroys in a conversation that we, when we had it in Columbia. Um, all of you had a rather strained relationship with those Chicago Conroys, uh, including the ones wearing the collars, right? Yeah, see, being military, we always were located in the South. And so I think maybe three times in growing up, we would go to Chicago on vacation <laughs> and visit. And we'd, we'd go to this, it was a Polish neighborhood, an Irish family in a Polish neighborhood. And Chicago is the most ethnic city in the world. The, uh, and we would get two or three blocks away from the house and we knew we were getting near because you, you could smell kidney stew in the air. That was what they cooked. Now, of course, we didn't eat it. The, so we would, we would visit. The adults would go in the basement and play pinochle for the next three days, drinking beer, playing pinochle, and we would wander the neighborhood. The, uh, that was our vacation. The, so we, we really didn't bond with, with a lot of relatives, you know. We didn't meet them that many times. So, and y'all may have a different uh, perspective. We felt very fortunate not being around them. <laughs> uh, they weren't the, they, yeah, we just were, they were, you know, saw each other all the time. They were, you know, he, my father had about, I forget how many kids, nine kids in his family. And there were, um, you know, so they saw each other all the time. They'd never left Chicago. And there was, you know, somewhat, since we were from the South, they would make fun of my mother. Okay, um, I was gonna say, that was one thing that really came out is, is yeah. that they were very cruel to your mother. Yeah. yeah. It and was culture shock. Yeah. It, it was Southern meets Chicago Yankee. And my yeah. father never, he wasn't the best traveler. <laughs> 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 His, uh, he would always uh, tense up. You know, he was always tense, but he was, he was especially dangerous and tense when he was taking a family on a, on a trip, on a road trip. And he was driving? Yes, yes. Right. But most of the time my mom wasn't on these yeah. trips, so it was just us with our dad. I'll say sometimes she didn't go to Chicago. She didn't she flew. go on the, she always flew <laughs> yeah. wherever we were moving. Oh. There was a deal with the military. If you had kids five and under, they could fly, and you got reimbursed so many cents per mile. For the so, ones at a certain age, yeah. you know. So they always flew. The rest of us drove, you know, rode in a Ford Country Squire, and Dad never stopped for a motel. We never spent the night. Or a bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> the gas breaks for better go to the bathroom when he stopped for gas because you weren't stopping again till the next time. The, uh, if, and we would go from Orlando to Chicago. Oh. And if he got tired at night, he'd, we'd pull off and he'd stop at a drive-in theater. You know, so he would sleep a little bit. Usually he got caught up in the movie, the James Bond movie or the horror picture. And, you know, we'd, we'd stop for about two or three hours and then on the road again. Kathy? All right, I can understand the boys talking about, but you know, at that point, at one point, you were old enough to go in the car and not fly with your mom, right? Right. And so you were there, well, I guess you and Carol were both in the car. Though. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> If something happened, Dad would just reach back, kashoo, 
You know? <laughs> Jim has a sound. Yeah, he does it better. Goosh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you'd be getting hit all the time, you know. Oh, Tim. Tim was such a joy on these trips. You remember Tim? <laughs> Tim was the youngest, you know, on these trips. And Tim, like, you know, on this country squire, you laid it flat so you'd fit in all the kids. Well, Tim, because he was youngest, he'd lay flat and put his arms out as far as he could. Okay, he's Nobody a, touched me. Okay, and he's a baby. <laughs> Mike's not saying. He's not the size he is now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is, he still does it. <laughs> I'm not saying anymore. <laughs> but, Tim, you want to defend you know, yourself? So he's, he's over there. Don't touch me. If, if you even brushed against him, yeah! <laughs> What's wrong back there? Do I have to, have to stop this car? No, Dad. You don't have to stop this car. <laughs> So he just thumped somebody? Somebody, Dan's thing, what do you say, when Tim, Tim was the worst. Uh, you couldn't touch Tim. Also, when he slept, he had to sleep holding a human ear. <laughs> so we would, we'd have Tim holding an ear. And then, you know, one of us would go crazy, they couldn't handle anymore. We'd have to switch Tim over, to, he'd fumble his arm. Then he would put a hand in another ear. But what Dad would not allow was crying from a kid. You know, you know and, and Tim would touch somebody and go, eh. And Dad would say, somebody better shut that kid up or I'll shut him up for him. <laughs> so as the oldest, you know, I found out that the best way, to, usually he was teething or something that he was going through. The best way to shut a kid up was up, I discovered paragoric when you know, the kids were. <laughs> And I would take a thing of paragoric on, you know, I'd just have it, I'd carry it, and I'd wipe Tim's gums. And two seconds later, he'd be in a codeine blackout. <laughs> but Dad... That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but he, would not, he could not tolerate a child making noise. He just could not do it. Well, let's take it from the car to the house. I mean, lots of kids, just normal kids. You, you got to be make, even the girls. You could be making some noise at some point. No, we weren't making noise. You weren't making noise. We sang songs, Walter. All right, you sang songs. Yes. What that was that, the that didn't. Pine tree song or? That didn't count as noise. Well, well, we could, we could do he that. Was, he it would say. Yeah, when, he it, would say. when it was yeah. time to sing, he the would, first he moment did. of the trip. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we were not singing for 500 bottles. <laughs> Things like 100 bottles of beer on the night. Please. please. Um, Is that what y'all did? 45 minutes. You know, sing some songs, stupid songs. You know, then it's cow bingo. You know. Oh, wait a minute. I mean, it, you know, that wasn't peculiar, by the way, the Conroys. Anybody who grew up right, yeah. in those days traveling before interstates. Uh, Air conditioning. Air you know, conditioning. And uh, what, ha what happened if you passed a white mule on your side of the car. You remember? It wiped you out. It wiped you out. You know. Or a white horse. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. And then you played the license state game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And all of this is an unair conditioned splendor. Mm -hmm. oh, it was never. It also was before interstates. You know, this was, uh, there weren't many interstates at that time. You know, in the, I guess, the late 50s and early 60s. And they were back roads, you know, driving across country. So it wasn't a joy. Uh, my favorite thing that Pat did in describing some of these trips is he had my, my father uh, in the Great Santini run over, you know, I guess, I guess the car would go over to the left late at night and you'd hear a thump thump and it was a turtle that he ran over. You know, and of course my father never did that. You know, he, was, he beat the hell out of us, but he left turtles alone. Let me ask you this, Jim. <laughs> How do you know he never did that? I didn't notice you born in that particular That's true. <laughs> he never did it when I was alive. He used to let, leave the turtles. He'd, he'd go for raccoons and you know, other animals. But uh, the turtles, he'd let go. But what was great about that is I saw so many people come up to him and say, you're such a jerk. You're such an ass for running over those turtles. And no matter what he said, 
people believed the rest of his life that he was just horrible to turtles. And uh, <laughs> I really appreciated that. But, you know, what I was interested, people didn't care that he beat his kids to a pulp. <laughs> That's true. No, turtles, turtles. That's true. It's, Melissa, look, I'm sure you've heard some of these stories before, right? Ah, uh, yeah, some of them. <laughs> um, what do you feel? How do you feel about that? Listening to these. Um, you know, I think that the this generation. I don't know how um, Don created you guys because. Um, because all the Conroys that I know, my uncles and aunts, are like the most uh, hilarious, uh, intelligent, clever, interesting people. Um, and it's just a joy to be around you guys. Um, because you, well, you turn that tragedy into humor, and that's sort of the way that the Conroys deal, and everybody's experiencing that right now in the audience. And so that's, that was my childhood, is like it was, it was, um, you know, it was interesting because if it, I hope it's okay with my sister Megan if um, if I tell this story. But today, when I saw her, she said um, that she wasn't expecting to have the reaction that she's had to being here, and especially watching the great Santini. Like it finally dawned on her. She was like, "Holy bleep!" She said, <laughs> "She said, Dad really went through that." <laughs> you know, she's like, "I saw that movie, and I realized, wait a second. Dad really went through this stuff, you know what I mean? It was like, for most of my childhood, part of my pa part of the past. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's a hard question to answer. It's something that's just like slowly dawning on us, being able to like sort of lift up the rock and look under the surface and see sort of what Sandra was talking. You know, you could also see those, that glimmer of that, you know, that fire in, in him and, and in Dad. You know, you see that, you see this, um, he said, like, they have, a, like, the, my uncles have a contest they call the dark one, you know. There's all, and usually it's you, Jim. <laughs> but it's usually someone, one of the four is the dark one. And it's when that, you know, it's when that cloud comes over and they just, they just go over to the dark side for a little while. And it happens to dad sometimes, too. But, you know. But, but overall, there's just this incredible creativity and um, the, what the gifts, I feel like they've given me the gift of the, um, the pleasure in, in um, being around them and the stories that they tell. And it's like, there's no, there's no other, like, there's just a warmth there and there's this sense of family that is so intense and um, loving. So it's kind of amazing. And um, the level of, uh, you know, what's the, I don't, I'm, maybe the word's sort of escaping. What, loyalty, yes. Um, it's really, it's really an enjoyment being around, <laughs> being around my family. So, so and, and, and if it wasn't, in, it's, but it's, it has to do with the way of subverting that tragedy um, because, you know, because that's the way that, that, that you guys have learned to deal with it. Um, and, it, and in the end, you guys have given us all this gift through that, right? Um, the story time. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> She's your daughter? Yes, my poor children. I, you know, this is a, there is sorrow, but I... <clears throat> it is funny. I've become so proud of my children so proud of my brothers and sisters. In all, they've had a lot to put up with in this revealing um, thing that I've gone through. I, you know, when I married Sandra, I remember meeting her family, and her family is far more outrageous, crazy. Her sons, each one would make a novel that would stunt America. <laughs> and then when I, when I told her about this, she said, she would never write about her family because she did not have that gift for betrayal that was given to me <laughs> at such an early age. You know? and, and I remember meeting, Santa and I got married before I met her family. And I remember 
we drove, you cannot believe the horror of where she comes from in Alabama. She's from Pinkard, Alabama. Watch it. Yeah. Huh? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> this is the, the wire grill, I forgot. This is the, it, Shannon comes from the ugliest town, Pinkard, Alabama. We were driving up there, and I don't know anything about her family. Only thing she's told me is she never met a Roman Catholic in her entire life until she met me. And, you know, we're only about 50. <laughs> I was like, you know, you talk about a, a restricted life. You've got to at least, you know, run into a Roman Catholic. <coughs> You're in a hardy somewhere, but, you know. So I'm driving home. Everybody knows I'm Roman Catholic. We turn into the peanut farm where she grew up. And to my surprise, she had not told me this, 50 dogs bound out to meet us. They surround the car. They leap up on the car. They look at me. They've never seen me. They continue barking. They're barking. We go in. I meet her father, who would be famous all over the world had Sandra written about him. <laughs> And he is swatting the dogs away from the car with a broom. He's swamped, dogs are flying. He's going with a broom. And I hear helicopters go overhead. And as I do, I look up and I said, Sandra, you have met Roman Catholics before. <laughs> there is a base, there is an army base near here. But it is, you know, but what Sandra has told me of that I love my family and brothers and sisters for is they've put up with me writing about them or versions of themselves over and over again. And this has been one of the greatest gifts I've received as a writer. I mean, one of the things I cannot thank you all enough for. And when Dad was saying the book was, Santini was a lie, um, the, the Chicago relatives were saying a lie to my amazement, my southern relatives said it was a lie. Um, uh, my brother and sister's back, 100%. Stood right by me. And, you know, as far as I know, they never wavered once. And that has been the greatest gift I think I've been given as a writer, you know, in this world. Now, Sandra. Where is that? Well, I think, Pat, I think Pat may have made a mistake because I know that not only did you go to Montevallo, but I know you spent, you would go to Mobile for Mardi Gras where you met real Catholics and a real Catholic celebration. So I, he was not the first one. Oh, no, 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 he was teasing about that. Um, <laughs> and what, but what, here's, here's what, what he's talking about is, I was talking about, uh, I, was, I was raised on a farm in a very small town in South Alabama. And uh, I only, you know, growing up, we had the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church, and that was it. So I was telling him, you know, and really until I went off to college, I didn't, I didn't know Roman Catholics and and you hung actually around met an with the, huh? You met a, you met an Episcopalian at Montevallo. I, I, well, I, yeah, I became one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you know, it was uh, it was an entirely different thing. He just got the timeline mixed up a little bit on that. I was a bit before fifty before I met my first Roman Catholic. But what I think he was he was saying he was saying about that is uh, I was exposed to more really than than I realized in this very um, idyllic in a lot of way uh, situation in that we were near Fort Rucker, Alabama, and I had some fantastic teachers at this little bitty, you know, county school that I went to because we had a lot of the officers' wives and, you know, we had a drama club and all this stuff because they would have these women who, who um, uh, women, you know, only women were teachers back then. Men were coaches, women were teachers, you know. But uh, with master's degree from, you know, uh, Chicago or something like this that ended up, bless their hearts, you know, near Pinkard, Alabama. So, uh, uh, yeah, that was, that's, that's how I'll help defend myself. <laughs> well, um, let's, let, let's move on to beyond, beyond the Santini and, and, and the conversation um, and talk about how the Conroys found Buford as their home. And um, Mike, let's start with you. Okay. 
I don't find Buford by home. <laughs> I, I know, I know. The, reason, I, the reason is we moved every year. When Pat was in Buford High School and Carol was in Buford High School, I was in fourth grade. I'm much younger than all of them. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> so we moved away. When I went to the University of South Carolina, my family moved back to Buford. So the younger sister, Kathy, Jim, Tim, they went to Buford High School. I didn't have the high school experience that they did, so I didn't make high school friends in Buford. So I come down here to visit family, but I don't have the connection that they have to Buford. The, uh, I like Buford. You know, my wife, Jean up there, would move here tomorrow if I'd let her. The, uh, but we live in Columbia, and uh, <laughs> I would say it's drier, but it's not anymore. <laughs> Y'all have, in Columbia, it doesn't have these things called no see <laughs> They And with this wet weather, they will carry you off for a pilot and drop you into the ocean. But um, I like, I have a house on um, Fripp Island, and so we go back and forth. So, okay. Tim? Well, t Tim. Tim you and, know, we, we first came to, to Buford, I guess, in 1960. Yes. Yeah. And so I was four. I was four years old. And then we moved away, you know, transferred to several different places. And, and then we came back in, what is it, 60? 70. 70. 70. Uh, and I was in the seventh grade uh, for... Um, one year, one year, and we, you know, I went to Beaufort Junior High, and then we transferred away again, and then came back, we, were, we, we went to Hawaii, and we, we were stationed at Camp Smith, uh, you were gone. Yeah, you and, get to go to and Hawaii. You, and you, <laughs> he's very bitter about it, too. And, and once you were gone, once Pat left, once Mike left, once you were gone, once Carol left, the kids, you know, the next in line, they were, you know, it was almost like you, you were missing this person who was very important to your safety. <laughs> 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 and, and so it got to be dicey there for a while. Um, and as, as it became where it was just Tom and I, uh, but, but it, anyway, we came back to Buford in, in 75, so I, I did have that pivotal uh, senior year in, at Buford High School and met a lot of friends. Well, well you know, you're talking actually a lot, but I, I remember in our conversation a while back, it was not so much I went to Buford High School, but when Tom died, yeah. how you felt enveloped by the community oh, that you had yeah. found. It was not just a physical thing. You went. You had a Buford High School ring. Is that all of a sudden you had friends? I mean, and everybody. When when that tragedy occurred, I mean, what happens? I mean, every one of us was just ripped apart, and you. We were just surrounded by a community of love in Buford, and I'll never forget that. Well, see, that's what I was talking yeah. about. It was yeah. not. It, it was yeah. how this community took you yeah. in. And I thank y'all for, I mean, so many friends that, that came to us uh, during a very dark time. And thank my wife a whole lot for getting me through that. Well. <laughs> well, even at, at, at that dark time, you, you found some humor because your uncle who presided at the service uh, buried the wrong Conroy. He buried you. It, it, was, it was stunning uh, walking into uh, St. Peter's. Um, and you know how you have the, the funeral cards um, and a prayer? And I flipped over the card, and it said, Tim Conroy. <laughs> uh, and Jim loved it. And he was like, <laughs> I he still have happy. the card. <laughs> <laughs> and I wished it was Tim that had died. 
they I remember were, seeing at the funeral. I turned around and I said, I'm looking at the same car and I said, Tim, I'm so sorry to hear you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> but I did this just recently. I wrote a blog and was talking about you know, this weekend. You know, we're, we're now living. As you're now living what I'm you know, writing about. And I said, that, you know, one of the things is that my brother Tim had, I said, my brother Tom had killed himself and uh, such and such thing. And my typist, Margaret Evans, thought I said Tim. So once again, the second time Tim's death has been announced <laughs> while he was still alive. You're, you're meeting the only human being that have, has lived through two suicides. <laughs> <clears throat> And, and my brother Jim too. called the dark one by all of us. He's the one, you know, the, the quiet. <coughs> oh, yeah, MLD. I forgot that. That's, we have a game with the boys. Oh, that, that was what it was. Huh? Do you remember this? I was trying to say. Okay, you Most do remember like this. Yeah. We play a game, MLD, yeah. and we usually do it Thanksgiving, Christmas, and it's, the game is called Most Like Dad. Okay. <laughs> and so we sit around, and we're all... And it kills us how much each one of us is like our father. You know, it, it, I die when I you know, think about how much I'm turning into dying. You know, I look at him and say, my God, I look like him. You know, I think like him. I joke like him. I sound like him. But the great thing we've been given is we play in all day. And Mike has his moments. And his wife, Jean, says, oh, you know, he's, he's most like, he's, He's the most MLD guy I can imagine. I just, you know, can't even believe anybody else being more MLD than my husband, Mike. I mean, he's, he's terrible. He's just terrible. And we go through it. We all have moments during every vacation where we act like Don. We act like uh, Santini. But we've been given a gift. We have one brother, the dark one. Okay, you can see it even now trying to think of something to say, how to react to this. Every time, without fail, Jim wins MLD every single day, every <laughs> single vacation, every single thing we do. And he can't even hide his face. What, what you see now is him trying to do, Dad, I do not care face. And he simply, he, all you have to do is look at him now and you see the presence of my father brought to radiant and glorious life. Jim? I, I was never asked how much I loved Buford. And I, I want to tell you that the people, of Buford, the people of Buford have meant so much to me. They've been wonderful people. And as for my brother Tim and two suicides, um, he would be famous today famous worldwide if he only was buried at one of those su suicides <laughs> in a military funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and what, and by the way, Pat says this about me, and it's not very fair, but I do want to thank Sandra, because she said she would never write about our family. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> Okay, let's, the previous panel talked about favorite Pat stories from your childhood, whether it's, whether, whether it is about an experience you had, your grandmother, your grandmother Peak, who was, I gather, a rather interesting person, your uncle the priest, your aunt the nun, smelling kid, something that you just want to share that we haven't talked about so oh, I far. I can tell you a great Pat story. That, and Mike and I were talking about it, um, I guess, a couple weeks ago. And Pat said, you know, tell this story because it's a great one. Can you and, lie and put me in there, too? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you real quickly. It's, we went up for my uncle's funeral in Chicago. And we went up there and, because, you know, my father was in Europe and he didn't know about the, you know, the, his, his brother passing. And so we went up to the funeral and uh, we were representing my father. And to make a long story short, at the end of the night, my uncle was telling us about another uncle that was with us in another room at the time. He had some mental problems and he was, um, you know, he used to, my uncle was saying, you know, he used to wander around and 
would carry a large butcher knife for protection. <laughs> and so, you know, we get to the hotel and my uncle tells us, hey, I got two rooms. One room's for Mike and I, and the other room is for Pat and my uncle Jack. <laughs> and, so, and so, Jack gets to the, gets to the door, gets the, gets the key, and heads off down the room, and he says, Pat, come on. And he says, Pat says, I'll be there in a second. And so, you know, and we're like looking at Pat going, hey, you know, watch out for that knife, Pat. You know, oh, I bet you're going to sleep well. And, and Pat is dying, and he's, he's looking at us, and he goes, let me tell you the difference between you boys and me. I'm an adult. I'm an adult, and I can handle the situation because I'm a man. You two are boys. And so then he goes, he walks up to the desk, and he goes, he takes out his American Express card, <laughs> waves it in front of us, man, boys. <laughs> he takes it, this is God's honest truth. And we're sitting back there looking at him, which, by the way, we've offered our room where he could sleep on the floor, um, which wasn't a bad idea. So he takes the card, and he tosses it on the desk to the clerk behind the desk, and he says, I'd like a room, please. And the guy looks at him and he goes, there's not a room in South Chicago that's open tonight. They're all booked. And we looked at him and we, Mike and I started walking away and we said, I'm a man. <laughs> that's a book. <laughs> and it was, it was a great story. So. That so much that's a true story. <laughs> OK, Tim. Story. I don't know. You're on your own. <laughs> Look on your arm. Let's go on the show. Um, you know, Pat has always been an, an adventuresome uh, chef, <laughs> and and um, when I would come down to visit with in at different times, you never knew what sort of phase of, of cooking he might be in, and so he's kind of gone through a whole lot of different things that he he's really loved, and one phase that was sort of interesting is is once I was down there, he had come in from a walk from the beach, and he had a conch that he had found on the beach. And he said, we have dinner tonight, Tim. This conch looks beautiful. And I said, Pat, are you sure that thing's alive? Or you know, where'd you find this? And oh, this conch will be delicious. You will love how I prepare this conch. And I was scared to death to eat this, this found Conch. Uh, and, and I didn't trust my big brother too much on, on preparing that, but he did. He cooked it. And I had a little, little bit. <laughs> well, you're also here. Yes. Mike? Let's see, I don't know of any particular story, but you know, we talked about Conroy humor, and uh, one thing that worked against us as kids. We teased each other mercifully. I mean, we, you know, our self-image was so bad because we would jump on each other, you know. I thought I was a troll, you know, in high school. I was about, probably about five foot four. And of course, my brothers and sisters never let me forget it. The, you know, each of us had a facial feature that would be our weakness. Pat, obviously, it's his nose. <laughs> the, uh, and my sister Carol would always, you know, just, my God, that nose, Pat. And she goes, let me, let me get my nose. Uh, you know, she'd do, my nose is so dainty and yours is so big, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Carol would say, Pat, have you ever looked at your nose in the mirror? <laughs> You've got a Nolan nose. That's like my, my grandmother, Sandy, had a nose that looked like it's been broken by a mule's hoof 1,000 times. <laughs> and so she said, you have a nose exactly like Stanley's. It's a Nolan nose. And it is the ugliest nose I've ever seen on a human face. Of course, at the time, I was about eight, and I never even noticed my nose when I looked in the mirror. From that day forward, I cannot look in the mirror 
without seeing this massive <laughs> growth on my face. And she says, my God, it's a nose like a pig. <laughs> now, but what I've loved recently is I've gone in, there's a, my physical trainer is a woman named Mina Trong from, and she's from Okinawa. And so I told her, I said, Mina, I know my, my nose is rather large, and my sister said it looked like nose like a pig. And Mina, and this one, right when I first met her, she said, no, your nose is not quite as ugly as a pig, as Mr. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> so it has been, you know, what it was was our family could make a fixation that we could get for the rest of our life. Carol, I've never gotten over this. You know, I never can look at my nose, anything like that. Uh, but Mike, how horrible for you to bring it up in public. <laughs> Actually, can I tell Kath? a story? Uh, 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let's it just go ahead. reminded me of something that happened the last when, at the South Carolina Book Festival. So I was on a panel with um, a couple other um, children's book authors. And you really cannot expect Dad to show up at your panel if it's any time before 1.30 p.m. So I knew he wasn't going to be showing up. But then, like, right about in the middle of it, Uncle Mike shows up. I was like, all right, hey, Uncle Mike. And then I heard all this whispering, hey, look, her dad just came in. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you guys actually look, you know, I, it didn't occur to me until that moment. I was like, yeah, actually, they, they do look a lot. Like, mean, I think it's the nose. Yeah. I think it's the nose. <laughs> Okay, Kathy, your last one. The story I want to say for what thinking about Pat and what he's done is when we found out my father was sick and, and how Pat reacted, and I don't know, some of you have siblings as writers, and in our house, because Pat's a writer, we tell him all the time, you don't have a real job, so you have to do it if we need something done. And Pat completely stopped everything for those two years my dad was sick. And we took care of him, and he had the best two years you could ever have had. Sam? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I was kind. Of, I was thinking about that time too. Uh, when when I came into the family, uh, Pat's dad had been diagnosed and uh, was was very sick. And as I was saying a few minutes ago, I had met him um, previously before his his diagnosis and when he got ill. And he he really stayed, you know, just just that. Uh, Charming, but he would uh, he would order Pat around, and he would take advantage of being <clears throat> being sick, you know, uh, because we kind of tease about it sometimes. He would he would just get real comfortable, you know, when he was staying out with us some at um, house and Fripp, he would get real comfortable, and he'd say, "Hey, Pat, make me a sandwich." <laughs> Always called it a sandwich, and. Uh, uh, didn't he eat the fried egg sandwich with uh, ketchup on it or real Yankee? Yeah. <laughs> Pat, you get the last comment. This is, holy my God. This is, <clears throat> I tried to get mom and dad to become Protestant after I was born. <laughs> and for them to believe in birth control. <laughs> and I think my career would have been more successful. I think my life would have been richer and fuller. Uh, I, you know, but, but I had, uh, you know, and I always, you know, one of the things that's funny about watching my brothers and sisters up here today, and of course, um, my daughter, well, I can't say this about my daughter, I just realized that I could not say this about Wu, is that I would go, and I remember each time each child was born. 
And I remember going in Cherry Point when Mike was born. And I thought, oh God, oh no, he's a boy. <laughs> and I always would fear for the boys because I knew that time would come. And when Kathy came, I thought, okay, this is going to be better. And, but I'd see these little kids put up in front. I'd wonder what their lives were going to be like. And I was the only one that knew what they were getting into. And I remember one of the times, when G I think it was after Jim was born, and that was in Cherry Point too, and then we went immediately to Orlando. And what, what Carol, about around that time, Carol was very, this is our poet sister who is not here and would never be here, is you know what she said, when we found out that mom had also had six miscarriages. You all knew that, didn't you? And, you know, so mom was pregnant all the time. But Carol got to me, and I always, if, I've loved Carol's, when Mike was home, but the wit, and the, Carol had a theory that the little miscarriages that mom had in an embryo heard what was going on with all of us <laughs> outside <laughs> and simply made some decision in embryo. <laughs> no way, man. I, uh, we're, we are not joining this at all. <laughs> but I remember each one of you when that nurse brought you to the window. And that was always one of the great exciting days of my life, is when you all joined, when you all joined the drill team. <laughs> well. I'd like to thank Pat's favorite sibling. Jim, his favorite sibling, Tim, his favorite sibling, Mike, his favorite sibling, Kathy, his favorite wife, Sandra, and his favorite child, Melissa, for being with us for this conversation. And we will, they will all be signing books uh, out in the lobby. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. <laughs>